jazz and blues is distinctively okay. USA. Okay, that's now that's democratic symbolic action, right? Just having the courage to find your voice with dignity and style in the face of terror, in the face of trauma, in the face of stigma, and still preserving your humanity, and that is distinctively democratic, you see. Because when you find your voice, that's what democracy is. The cacophony of voices of citizens, not just through voting, but you right in other ways as well. So there is something distinct enough. That doesn't make America exceptional in the sense that America stands outside of the laws of history. Every society has its given who will write the decline and fall of that society. Now, a lot of American acceptance will say, America will never fall because America is American. God loves America. That's a lie. <laughs> That's not true. That's what exceptionalism is at the ideological level. But there's historical specificity. And you would agree with me here because as a, as a Marxist, context makes a big difference here. Right? The jazz comes out of the way here in the way that it does it in Lithuania. Man, I love Lithuania, but I mean, it wasn't listen. the site where Democratic symbolic action called blues and jazz flowered and flourished. You see what I mean? All right, let's take another question on the right side. I want to thank Brother uh, West and Brother Dix. Uh, Brother Dix, again, thanks for doing the New Orleans takeover with us back yeah. in 2007. Yeah. Brother yeah. West, um, thank you and Tabitha for featuring our organization work in Chicago, the anti-eviction campaign, um, work on the poverty tour. You know, we really appreciate that. They gave a lot of birth to the Occupy Our Homes movement, which I want to talk about real quick. I need folks in here to text us at Occupy Our Homes shot to 23559. Um, for this NATO summit, we're about to show the world how the people don't need government no more, don't need the banks no more. We the people about to take over 100 homes in Chicago and house homeless people. If you want to get down, text this number. But it brings me to this question, though, my brother. You know, as I was saying, that it was radical time, so it calls for radical change. You know, I don't like to label myself, but I will tell people this. I'm with the Chicago Anti-Eviction Campaign, one of the founders, part of the Take Back the Land movement. I support the mental health movement on the front line so we're not, you know, cyberspace and way of support. Solidarity is an act, not a statement. Um, I'm also part of Occupy the Hood, Occupy Chicago. I'm an Occupy and an organizer. It's neither either or. You know, we need to do everything. But you raised an interesting question, my brother. And I'm going to take my head off for it. Talk about the church. Let's talk about these churches, right? Because right now we had a critical time as we were doing the civil rights struggle. Yeah. And the churches stepped up their game and got to the front line of the struggle. How do we get past the prophet, follow financial, minister money, deacon, daughter, reverend, rip off, out the churches, in the street, to stop the violence, to stop us from losing our home, losing our society, losing our community? Is it time for all of us, not just us? If I do it, it's going to be a lot of demonization and locking up. But with y'all, brother, is it time for us to occupy the church and free Jesus? Is it time to occupy the church? All right. All right. All right. Boy, that's all right. Okay, that's... Oh, brother, I I think, I'm not trying to be brother. funny, brother. I say this because when these mental health patients yeah. took the front line and said we're going to take back our clinic, take back our dignity, in the name of human rights, you know, the, the word that America used to drop bomb from foreign nation, although it abuses human rights at home. When these people did that, guess who were the first group of people, Mayor Rahm Emanuel, the dictator, called? The churches. He called the people, he called the churches and told them what? Do not stand with these people. And so we recognize something for that, right? That he feared the power of the church. So I need y'all help to get these preachers out the churches and to the streets because they put clothes on churches too, bro. Yeah, no, no. Thank you, no, thank you. That's powerful. You want to address that? No, that's just, that's just a powerful formulation. I, I've never heard that formulation, let alone put so eloquently. Yeah, that's powerful. 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 Yeah, that's how do you bring the Kool-Aid back to the level of the blood? Now, on one level, that's just not a human affair. 
You see what I mean? What, what we're talking about is those who have shut themselves from Psalms 121. I look, I lift up my eyes to the hills, what comes my help. They don't want the help. They want to be in control. They want to master it all for their own personal gain, which means they shut off the grace, shut off the blood, shut off the transformation, and then they basically have a business rather than a church. They got a CEO rather than a pastor. That's part of the marketization with the corporate model, you see. So then when you occupy a church, of course, I'm speaking from my own Christian perspective, my brother. We've worked this out in terms of how you put pressure, because I do believe putting pressure on people. They need prison ministry rather than building funds and so forth and so on. But, but when you talk about something like the church, you have to be vulnerable. You have to be open. You have to be willing to take a risk. Old folks used to say, it's a matter of stepping out on nothing and landing on something. Well, if you don't have any courage to step out on nothing, you're never going to be a Christian anyway. You're going to be a church, you know, you're going to be going church, church anity and taking the Christ out of Christianity and so forth and so on. That's something else. And how do you do that? The, the, the way you do keep in mind, when Brother Martin uh, and, and Dixon and, and Rosa and the others brought those folks together in Montgomery, it was like 12 churches out of 100 churches. Well, there never was an ass moving among the churches. Most of the preachers scared. And they were tied to the powers that be. The mayor called up the minister, stay away from that Martin King. He's a Turk working on a dissertation at Boston University. Don't know what's going on down here in Alabama. And most of them said, you got a point, man. <laughs> See what I mean? When Martin came to Chicago. How many churches supported him? How many? That's about one reason we went to the west side. It was what? It, well, we had some, but it was very small. Now, somebody knows the history. We we, we had Sister Bar 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 what's her name? Was Sister Tillman? Yeah, the great Dorothy Tillman was just in the, with us two weeks ago. She told the whole story. So you did have a few on the south side, but you had to go to the west side because the south side was hegemonic in terms of oppositionally tied to daily. Oh, ain't no doubt about that. You ain't right. Yeah, we're not talking about the vanilla side right now, though, brother, but you're absolutely right. The white churches were unified. Well, usually there is a small, small slice of courageous white brothers and sisters in the churches. Now, they have difficult Thanksgiving dinner. Because <laughs> they got a lot of relatives, you know what I mean? But you got to keep that open, that small slice. And keep in mind, it was a white judge named Frank Johnson who made the decision, wasn't it? In Montgomery, those 380 some days. That white judge made a difference. Yale Law. This stuff will come out of here. <laughs> Decision in favor of the struggle against American apartheid. That was a major move in the same way the Warren Court gave some momentum. But the point is, even back then, the churches were not as a mass movement supported. But the problem is, our, our prophetic churches are weaker now than ever. But they're bouncing back. That's why I like your spirit in terms of occupying to put pressure. Okay. Yes. 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 So we've got yes. we've got three more minutes. Unfortunately, we've got a long Ooh. queue. So I think we can only take one quick question and relatively short, you know, short answer. Okay. <laughs> and then we're gonna have to wrap it up here. Last one over there. Quick question. Thank you to both of you, first of all. Dr. West, we met the first week of Occupy Wall Street when I was living there on my air mattress and had mm -hmm. our mutual friend, uh, Tony Morrison, to see your sellers play. And I wanted to get your vision of the future, not just for the Occupy movement, but for everybody. I know you've spoken on that, but what you see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The future of the world. However you choose to analyze that, but the future of the Occupy movement and how everybody can be inclusive into that world. I think so. I think that's going to be a great way for us to kind of like have maybe some closing short yeah, statements about um, say so. the, a vision for the future. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. See, I really believe that uh, the future is open-ended. It's unpredictable. I don't think any of us you know, are some of the life of Nobody would have thought that Occupy movement would emerge when it did. Who would have thought we'd be talking about corporate greed, the wealth inequality, they given the, uh, the right wing and neoliberal uh, development center public discourse. Talking about austerity, austerity, all the way from the view of the lenders and 
support the massive investment in jobs, massive investment in housing, massive investment in health care from the youth of working and poor people. Who would have thought? So, if we can engage in that kind of shift. So, it, I think so much depends on what kind of choices we make. There might be a massive democratic awakening that historians have no analytical tools for in the next year. Or there could be sleepwalking. We slowly go on. It's hard to say about this. I really don't know. All I know is, as for me, I know what I'm going to do. Oh, I know what I'm going to do. I know what my calling is. So that we end up crushed, go to jail, murdered, or whatever, you know, like B.B. King, I had a smile on my face singing the blues. But I'm here. I hope to be a whole lot of other people, or might be just with a small group. But I've already made my choice. And I made my choice 50 years ago. And I'm, I'm going to be faithful unto death. Okay. Uh, to wind this up, I was torn between Woman on the Edge of Time and a quote from Lennon about dreaming. Let me just do the quote from Lennon about dreaming because it's short. These two guys, these two revolutionaries was talking. Sneers at the idea of dreaming. And then I said, no, this other guy had the correct approach to dream. You have to dream. You have to dream big dreams. Dream a vision of a new way for the world to be. But then compare your dreams to the reality. And constantly work to narrow the gap between your dreams and reality. If there's no gap between your dreams and the current reality you live in, you ain't really dreaming. So you got to dream some big dreams. That's how we got to go at it. And then drawing a woman on the edge of time, the future is not written. We are struggling for it right now. If we respond to today with silence, we will get one future. If we respond to today with determined mass resistance, then we can write another future. My suggestion is write that other future, sisters and brothers. Respond with me. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank my guests.